Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our fourth masterclass for the Swiss Chess Federation. Tonight, we have the great pleasure to welcome a living legend of chess. This is Judith Polgar. Judith, hello. Hello, good evening to everybody. I'm happy to be here. I will say a few words in, in German and French to welcome our, our guests from uh, the, the French part and the German part of Switzerland, since this masterclass will be held in, in English. Uh, herzlichen, herzlich willkommen zu allen deutschsprachigen uh, Gästen hier zu dieser vierten Masterclass für, die, für den Schweizerischen Schachbund. Uh, wir haben die große Ehre, heute Abend uh, Judith Polgar als Gast zu haben. Mesdames et Messieurs, bienvenue à cette quatrième masterclass pour la Fédération Suisse d'échecs. On a le grand plaisir et l'honneur d'avoir une, une légende des échecs avec nous ce soir pour ces deux heures de masterclass. Il s'agit de Judith Polgar. Et donc, je passe maintenant à la langue anglaise. Ça va être pendant deux heures en anglais. Judith, I, I will make a, a short introduction of, of yours as a chess player, as a person for, for maybe youngest who don't know you too well because um, uh, you, you are exactly my age, you are also 43, and uh, you retired from competitive chess a few years ago um, after a, a rich and very successful career. You, you started out um, at, very, at a very, very young age, um, and you became strong very early too. Um, you were uh, brought up in a, in a chess uh, environment, in a chess family. Your two sisters, elder sisters, are extremely strong as well. Susan became uh, the world champion among women. She's also a, a men grandmaster. And uh, the middle sister, Zofia, um, stopped chess, uh, I think, but she, she became an international master among men and was one of the very best uh, women chess players in the world. As concerns you, uh, you actually had great success when you were very, very young. You stunned the world with your tactics, your tactical vision, uh, sharp attacks, and uh, you became uh, a man grandmaster at the age of 15, which was a record at the time. You beat uh, the record, the former record of Bobby Fischer. So you were the youngest uh, grandmaster ever uh, in 1991. And after that, you climbed uh, further on to reach the top 10 in the world. Your best ranking in the world was number eight in 2005 with a numerous tournament success. I, I mean, the list is too long to, to, to give all the tournaments where you have been uh, the winner. And um, you've also qualified to the world championship uh, final when it was held in, um, in Mexico in 2005, was it, I think? And uh, after that, you continued uh, playing at the top, at the top level, until you decided to retire after the Olympiad in 2014. It was held in Tromsø. And um, well, Judith, perhaps you can you can show us a little example of uh, of this event because you you won a game with a with a with a nice combination, didn't you? move was g3, defending the mate on h2. And uh, I was kind of very happy with this move. First of all, because the bishop is, uh, is blocked by the g3 pawn. But maybe while I'm talking, my audience can uh, think about it. How did I make advantage of the weaknesses of the white king? And uh, actually, I found a, a very fast uh, mating attack right Judith, here. We can, we can perhaps, uh, perhaps say uh, to our, um, our spectators that they are uh, encouraged to take part 
because you, you're going to give them a few puzzles along the way. And of course, I'm sure people will be eager to, to find the same moves as you have, the same winning moves. And so the chat, uh, people can write their answers, their suggestions or questions also later on in the chat, which is uh, located on the screen, on the right side normally of, of your screen on YouTube. So uh, uh, please don't hesitate here. Judith encouraged you to find a, a a great combination for, for black, so don't hesitate to write uh, your, uh, your ideas in the chat. Judith, I'll let you go on. Sure, because I think it's always fun to, to figure out a nice move, and I know from my childhood how happy I was always finding some tactical beauty in chess. So, of course, I want to inspire all of you to uh, really think about it, and once you see the solution, you can write it in the chat. So the idea is that actually after white is grabbing the rook on h2, black is giving a check on, these, on d2. And once uh, white is going out with the king or queen g2, the same thing happens to white, queen h6. And even though black has pretty much uh, material down, but my bishop is very powerful and I would give checkmate. So this is kind of a, a very nice memory for me from the Olympiad in Tromso, and uh, we won the silver medal also with the Hungarian team, so it was a very beautiful finish yes. of my and career. And the Hungarian team, which has been very successful all along the way in, in the history of Olympiads, but also with your participation. Uh, how, many, how many medals have you made with a Hungarian team? Well, uh, at first uh, occasion, together with my sisters, I won the Chess Olympiad twice. So I have actually team gold medal of two, and I have individual gold medals of three. And later on, I started to play in the men's competition mm -hmm. since 94. And I think I played uh, 10 times in the open section. We won uh, twice uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. medal of silver. And also championship, we won once a bronze medal. Great, yeah. But Hungary was for quite a long time, and we were always a candidate of having a medal. Mm -hmm. But uh, the most painful uh, occasion was in 2000 in Istanbul, where I made an incredible performance, and I had a lot of uh, entertaining and fun games. But still, in the last second, somehow, things turned out the way that we didn't win a uh, medal and we were very very close so that that was kind of a painful one but two years later in Vlad we won okay nice I will I will uh, certainly come back to this um, these um, success of uh, of yours with your sisters uh, in in very early Olympiads uh, when we speak about your upbringing and your your path from being a child prodigy to to the very top of the world uh, I, I will also um, say to, to spectators that for instance in the last um, in the last game that you just chose that showed against Guerrero I, I loved this geometry of, uh, of after you're giving up the rook on h2 the queen coming d2 and then back to h6 that's sometimes very complicated to see th those kind of backwards uh, moves and uh, I'm sure with um, all the experience that you have in um, tactics, uh, how to learn tactics, tactics and how to spot those patterns, you'll certainly be able to give some uh, um, useful advice to all our, our viewers and especially youngsters. Um, I, I think it's probably the right time to, to really, since we're speaking about youngsters, to, to start where you started. You said you, you learned the rules when you, you were about five. And uh, how, I mean, your sisters are older by seven and, and three years, or... Oh, all right, yeah, so... Uh, all right, and they were, all, they were already, of course, so... Susan was already a very strong player when you started with the rules.
Wow. Mm -hmm. because we are closer in age mm -hmm. and, and uh, so we had lots of journey and, and uh, fights and argue and a lot of chess uh, we played a lot of blitz games we did lots every day we played I played at least like 20, 30 blitz games. We were also uh, training, playing blindfold games against each other. Of course, those things are much simpler to have your training in tactical field, for example. There are many different websites where you can uh, challenge yourself in how fast you can give mate in two, mate in three, back rank mate, double attack, whatever. In those days when I was a kid, we had the wall full of... Uh, uh, small chess boards and uh, and then uh, we were having every day like, like 30 puzzles to the trainers were, were setting up with small magnetic plate pieces and um, so it was something that uh, it was very manual it was very very analog kind of thing mm -hmm. have computers we didn't have any technology and everything was uh, done by the trainers by books and magazines. I remember how eager we were, how happy we were when a chess informant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we first had a computer, and with the first, first mm -hmm. database, Th those those were uh, an interesting time and very challenging, and so on. Sure, sure, uh, Judith. There, there was apparently a, a few moments where people uh, couldn't hear you for some reason. We don't know. So just uh, I'll sum up that you, your parents were actually. Um, raising you and your sisters at home, so in a sort of homeschooling um, way of, uh, of doing. Your two parents are, um, are teachers, so they, they know how to, to, to teach kids and what to say, how to do it. Uh, although at, in those times in, uh, in Hungary, this was pretty unusual and not, uh, not well received by the government, the chess federation and so on. But you, you kept on, uh, your parents uh, insisted and went on that path of, um, of teaching, teaching you chess, but not only chess at home. And, um, and this is how actually you made your, your path and your way uh, 
through by by learning chess and I think that's more or less when when they had you back we had you back I mean I heard you all the time but apparently not online um, and uh, when you were actually training chess on the board over the board with books uh, awaiting eagerly um, notebooks uh, magazines and of course chess informators and so on coming by post uh, well something nowadays we don't even even think about because in one or two clicks on the internet we have all the material we have plus analysis and so on and so forth in those times how, how would you say um, how would you rate the um, actually the um, level of, of um, self-instruction that we could get um, by analyzing on our own games, positions, what, whatsoever, without any external help. I, I think I'm thinking of computers above all. Uh, how important is it, uh, in your opinion? I think the game of chess as a sport it changed a lot. I mean, if I want to be uh, very hard, I have a different sport compared to the sport we had back uh, when I was a, a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think simply it's it's really, it's so, really different. so different. When I was a when kid, I was and a I think kid, also when, I you, think were also when you were a kid and started kid to study, and, and started to study. It was, of course, you have to visualize it. That I had a chessboard at home. I had a trainer or a training partner. Training partner. Usually, I had a book usually next to I had me. Or we also had a card system. We also had a one card and one game. My parents, my parents were developing a card system, a card system which was sorted which out, was sorted uh, out uh, uh, in uh, in AB uh, in ABC and also by the by the codes of the chess opening. So that was something very useful. So that was something very useful. Actually, it was a paper based. Uh, work and uh, analysis, work and analysis, which was very which was interesting, very interesting, deep, but very of course deep, looking but of course back, looking, slower it was much development slower and development and understanding, of, and the understanding of the game. And now I think uh, it is maybe too much of the computer uh, vision for many youngsters. I would advise definitely that computer is very good, it's essential, databases are essential, information is a must. Uh, to follow games of, of uh, strong players is a must, but also very advisable to look on the chessboard or even if you look at it on the screen, don't switch on the computer, the engines all the time. It is better that sometimes you take a look on the position, analyze it for a short time, and then to check it with the computer. Of course, the very unpleasant situation that uh, you may realize analysis were not good enough and actually the computer they didn't think your weakness immediately mm -hmm. and uh, it is a very it can be a very bad feeling but I think it can be also uh, and uh, you can learn a lot from that that if you you at first you you start to understand the position and uh, and then you check it with the computer. Nowadays, of course, you have to be a very well a self-controlled person, not to check the engine immediately or even after a game. You finish the game, you go to check with the computer what was its uh, suggestion. So from this point of view, it's very difficult. But for example, in opening preparation, it's very important what is the latest new or the latest fashion. But it's extremely also extremely important to understand the position, understand the position itself. itself. So, for example, so for when, example I was a kid, when I was a kid, I was uh, playing on a special, on, position, uh, on a special was, position, which I was with learning my with coach. my coach. Let's say, let's say, Ry Lopez or, 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 or Philidor, or Philidor, or Kings Indian, or whatever. Kings Indian, we were looking whatever. at, this, we were looking at the theory, uh, then we were looking a lot of played by theme games, by played by possibly birds. We were also playing possibly we were also playing blitz games. Or rapid games type on that position. specific type so of position. So to make ourselves so more to make ourselves the, more the, understand the, the, the what kind of the spirit of the position, there, what, what kind, kind of ideas, patterns are there, what kind of ideas, what, what kind, kind of typical, typical that tactics specific are there in that specific opening. And I think that's very important to understand it because uh, I think it happens with the on the highest level also that they use computers, they flash out the first 10, 15, 20 moves. 
And then uh, suddenly they start thinking maybe half an hour because they not necessarily understand why the engine was yeah. evaluating the position being good for yeah. for them, let's say. I even had a, I for me actually it was a very difficult journey to to admit that I have to use the engine. I had a, a game against uh, Michael Adams, who was the one of the top players of England, and, and I played against him. The Marshall he played the Marshall attack against me, and before the game it was I think 2000 uh, early 2000 I think. And uh, I analyzed the game, the, the opening preparation before the game, and I found an option. The computer, the engine was suggesting that if I really reach this position with this move, I think, plus rear mm -hmm. or something like that. And I got this at the board, and uh, Adams was surprised. He reacted in a way that... Um, I was, um, I don't even remember if I was expecting it. I think he made a surprise to me. And then I was wondering, I have, I can, I could repeat moves or I could uh, 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 go out of it. And I said, okay, but the engine said that I'm winning. So I cannot repeat the moves and make a draw, mm -hmm. right? And actually the problem was that objectively the best move was to agree to a draw and it was a repetition mm -hmm. perpetual check. And uh, these kind of uh, situations, of course, happen not only with me, but even one of the most famous example, I think, the World Championship match between Kramnik mm -hmm. and Lakeover. Actually, it was also a martial yes. attack, and uh, I think it was a full home analysis mm -hmm. for Leiko. So sometimes it can be misleading. Of course, nowadays, engines are much more... Uh, uh, they are much better. They evaluate in a much more precision and also V players understanding the computer's judgment and the ideas much mm -hmm. better. So engines really changed a lot, but I would, uh, I would really say to youngsters that they have to mix it very well and they have to be very smart how much they are using and, uh, and taking the advices of the computer because I think Magnus is uh, fantastic quality apart from many but uh, uh, I think it's very important that he's using all the possibilities what technology gives in modern preparation, but he has the self-confidence. Well, he has all the right to do so, right? Uh, he had all the self-confidence uh, in being critical about the computer's decision, or if he thinks that there is an interesting idea and he believes in that, and even if the computer is telling him that, well, maybe it's not the best move, if he really has this strong feeling that he believes in that, he goes for it. So I think the most important thing. We might have lost Judith. We might have lost Judith. Uh, now, now uh, yes, you're back, you're back. Good, that was a very, very short interruption. You're back. It's good. So you were speaking about uh, Magnus. No, no problem. You were speaking about Carlsen's uh, main strength of in having this confidence uh, of trusting himself over the computer, basically. Yes, I think you have to trust the computer on a certain degree, but you also have to understand and know yourself what kind of positions, for example, and what kind of structure suits you and you feel comfortable with mm -hmm. because a uh, computer can help you until maybe move 15 or 20 or something but uh, later on you are on your own and nobody's going to help you so you have to uh, be confident and feel good about the position and the mm -hmm. middle game mm -hmm. or even the end game of course and I would also put a lot of emphasis on end games. When I was a kid, uh, I had many trainings on rook end games, primary, and also on other end games. But I think nowadays it's also at least as important. Maybe this is the one thing which really didn't change so much in chess. So that you have chess, to know a lot of theory of end especially games, especially because we play a lot of rapid lot of games, rapid and, games the controls and the time are controls are much shorter. Are much shorter. Back, Back when I was a kid, we still had adjourn games. I'm not sure if any of the audience uh, knows what is that, but it's very strange, but we played with...
course, end game knowledge was not that important because most, most likely, if you reach the end game, you could go you home, could go or, you home or you had a little time, little time searching, of searching it, or it or analyzing, analyzing the position. position. But nowadays, but nowadays obviously, obviously, we don't have this option. option. You have to go, you have to go all, the all the way. And also, when and you also, reach the end game, you have usually less time. You're in time trouble. You're tired. Etc. So endgame is a very important part because you can save a lot of points on there. Even on the highest level, you will always find that top players are making even simple mistakes uh, the last part of the game. Yeah, that's true. And like, this is certainly because of the time control and pressure at the end of the game with the 30 second increment. We, uh, people have to survive with 30 seconds and we don't have the time to to think deeply of endgame strategies and uh, it's it's become more more and more a sport and uh, definitely then Magnus Carlsen and some others have different qualities to to what was needed 30 40 years ago in the times of adjourned games uh, I'd like to come back to the um, to the moment when you you gave some advice to young players as concerns the use of engines or computers and uh, I, I would like to, to have your opinion on perhaps when is the best time for or, or best level, let's say, for a, for a youngster to start using the computer. I mean, at least in a certain balance or um, should they start right from the beginning or should they wait until they are, let's say, maybe 1800 or what, what is your, your opinion on that? I think there are different ways of using computer technology, engines, websites, because uh, of course uh, there are many ways of, of studying, but if you, for example, want to solve problems or tactical problems, I think there is no better way than going to different websites and really uh, experience the, uh, the, the fast and the mess of examples. I think that's very important that you really make a mess of hundreds or more over thousands of tens of thousands of different uh, patterns that you can repeat again and again and uh, practice again and again. Mm -hmm. So those things I think for example you can do that from the very beginning from since uh, you know already some of the the basics but definitely it's very important that uh, whatever you do, you, you have your success in that. So don't uh, try to, to go on a, on a level where obviously you're not there yet and you're not going to get uh, uh, positive feedback. You're, if you're not going to solve the problem, you, you will feel bad about it. So I think it's very important that you do something for your own level where at least 70 or 80% of the puzzles you are going to be able to solve because that gives you a very good feeling and the motivation also to go and move on forward. And also to play online, I think it can be interesting, especially if you do it with your friends and maybe after the game you can analyze it, you can discuss it. Where did you go wrong? Why did you go wrong? Um, how should have you be playing better? Maybe next time I will do this or that. So I think it's important to not only to do it what you do online, but to analyze it and discuss it and, and to have this mindset of uh, being critical about yourself and always looking how to improve yourself. In that case, I think it can help. But of course, if you have your friend uh, coming over to your home, which is nowadays, it's it's not such an evident uh, and obvious thing, mm -hmm. right? For sure. But uh, but I think if you're smart, you can use it on your your benefit a lot. The internet possibilities for chess. I wouldn't suggest to play bullet, for example, because I mean, for fun, it is possible, but don't be hooked on that. Because it's, it doesn't give too much uh, if you want to be professional or if you want to be competitive. It's more of uh, having a good time, seeing a movie, uh, playing table tennis or whatever. But uh, that you cannot take it as a serious uh, training. Mm -hmm. But uh, to challenge yourself on, on puzzles uh, and to play with friends or, or even other people online... Uh, for example, I know that uh, some of the websites they can uh, they suggest that you can play theme 
position that a specific uh, opening position i think that's a very nice uh, way of doing it also mm -hmm. if you want to practice a certain opening and i know also that many of the grandmasters and top level players when they were developing a new opening system into their repertoire they were practicing online and uh, and i think it is very important so especially if you develop a new opening that's also a very good platform for uh, for for kids, for amateurs to be practicing uh, their opening systems. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways of, uh, of doing it, but, uh, but it's important to be smart and conscious about it, being delib deliberate on, on what you're really aiming for by using the internet. And then to use the engine, I think, I think what you suggested that maybe 1800, it's a good idea to start using the engine, but I think you cannot simply avoid mm -hmm. So even beforehand, you're going to meet the engine some sure. one way or another. And, uh, but I think it's very important if you see a suggestion by a computer to spend time to understand those evaluations and the move suggestions. So it, it is very important to, to feel comfortable understanding and not blindly believe what the computer right. says. That's, that's a very important uh, insight indeed. Uh, bouncing back on the on the training games you're suggesting perhaps to do online, but which were also important uh, back in the days when it was not possible to play on the internet simply because the internet didn't exist. Uh, I think you have a little, a little uh, puzzle to show to our uh, spectators. Uh, of yours, um, your earlier training sessions. Um, perhaps you can show us uh, this, um, this training game you were playing, or perhaps the end of the training game. Yeah, this, uh, yeah the, the trainings what we had uh, together with my sisters, it was very common that uh, during the week we had our trainers coming over and we had a few hours uh, in the beginning, only half an hour, an hour. But by the time I was like age 9, 10, I had at least six, seven hours of training. But on the weekends, usually we had some other talented uh, youngsters, young uh, boys coming over, and we were playing five minutes blitz games. And this is one uh, from that example that, uh, of course, when you learn a lot of tactics and you solve a lot of problems, how to implement it and how to be sharp in a game and how to recognize all these patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So here I'm playing with the black color and uh, well, it should be probably a draw. And that this is what my opponent Palkovi was also thinking that, okay, why to play knight f3? Just let's go for a draw. He didn't have much time. And he played rook takes f2, counting on my pawn taking the rook, king takes the pawn, and then it's a completely draw is the position. But as I was studying a lot of tactics and solving thousands and thousands of uh, puzzles of that, I instantly came up with the deflection of the king from G2. And uh, probably many of our viewers thought already, and especially I can even give a hint that it's the same move as in the previous mm -hmm. game, which is kind of funny that again, I go rook h2. So this h2 square is very strong in this second game also. And then after king h2, uh, after king h2, e takes f. And the important thing is that this is also interesting in chess that uh, that the sometimes pieces are extra piece can be painful for uh, white. And in this position, if the knight would not be on e1, then king g2 would be possible to save uh, white, but in this case it's not possible because the pawn is going to be queening in the next move. So this is, uh, I just wanted to show you because this was very typical how I could implement it in a blitz game and immediately once I was practicing a lot of puzzle solving, in blitz games you're testing yourself how sharp you can be in your tactical mm -hmm. vision. And I think this helped me a lot uh, also not only to be very good in tactical, uh, on the tactical field, but also to gain a great of self-confidence. And when you're a kid, obviously you need it very much, when you're an adult as well. But this, this was somehow building my, uh, my uh, self-confidence very much. And I, I was always very happy when I could 
make some funny tactical ideas. How, how were your, uh, or your father, how was your father training you and your sisters in the tactical fields? Was he, uh, was he giving you like hundreds of, of positions on the same tactical pattern in order to, to have your vision totally, um, totally clear on any, any pattern so that you could just instantly recognize any, any, any ideas? Yes, that's how it was. Uh, you remember, and maybe some other viewers also remember, we had the combination encyclopedia, mm -hmm. but also there were tons of uh, different kind of chess books. We had many thousands of chess books at home, a huge library. And uh, we could, uh, first of all, I, uh, I studied a lot of puzzles, tactical themes. And, uh, and also a lot of studies, to be honest. And not everybody shares uh, this view of mine that I think also to have not only practical, uh, tactical uh, positions to solve, but also I think it gives, uh, it gives a good vision and it triggers your brain very well if you study uh, studies mm -hmm. as well. I like the Kubel, for example, a lot, Reiti, Kasparian, there were some uh, few, also mm -hmm. Banco I liked very much. The problem was that he was always making not only very beautiful studies, but also very difficult ones. He was, I think he's definitely one of the best or definitely world top study maker, composer. And uh, Tim Mann is making also some studies also from practical mm -hmm. games. But I know that I really loved and it made me engage so much these, uh, these compositions. And even today, I like them very much when I see them here and there. Uh, because, uh, and also because I was really solving thousands of them. If I get a puzzle, uh, sometimes uh, Kremnik sends me some puzzle or some other uh, people or I see something, somehow I have a touch for it. I have a feeling for it, more or less, what move should it be? So because I was looking and solving so many of them, I have a feel for it the same way as uh, if I see a Sicilian, more or less I know a uh, Rook B1, Rook A1, right? Maneuvering, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be attacking. Mm -hmm. I kind of have a similar feeling for which direction the study should be going and uh, what should be the theme, while there are very, very difficult ones as well. But uh, I like the ones which I can still solve and I can, uh, I can really feel the beauty of that uh, example. But I think it can be very important in the long run also to to find some kind of uh, difficult elements in a game. It, it, is, it is good that if you have also this kind of not necessarily very practical uh, studies. I remember when I was playing in Dos Hermanas uh, late 90s, I think, and then and Anand and, and Swidler had uh, two pawns and king against Anand having one knight and the king. And it was very much of a study-like position. And uh, while I was still playing my game, I uh, remember they agreed to draw and actually it was winning in that specific position. Mm -hmm. And it was very much study-like uh, situation. So for me, it was kind of natural to solve these, uh, these studies. And still, I can only advise to youngsters to not to study every day necessarily many examples, but let's say to study a day would just help mm -hmm. them. There is even the, this uh, story, uh, you, can, uh, you can confirm if it was true, of, of your sister Susan um, studying chess uh, in the evening with a trainer and they couldn't really solve a, a problem and they, w they went to wake you up where you were really small and uh, they went to wake you up to get the solution and you found it instantly. Is that a, a true story or, or some sort of legend? Well, we had many stories of, uh, of having uh, people around in the apartment because we had a very small apartment at the time, but uh, still uh, many times we had guests coming over and then we were playing blind games and then we were solving puzzles and uh, the chess was all over from morning to evening. So we have many stories <laughs> like that. 
Um, well, you you were actually uh, three three girls uh, in a in a in a world of a lot of men playing chess, and especially at the time, when well, well, nowadays we can say there are many. Uh, women and, and girls who are strong grandmasters. At the time, it was not the case, and you had to fight your way through uh, to the top. As a, first of all, your your elder sister Suzanne, and and then Sofia and yourself. How difficult was it in in those days um, to be in a in a world in a microcosm full of men, basically, and boys. For me, it was very natural because this is how I grew up and Susan was already playing against adults and mostly with men. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this was something, not anything special for, for me when I was a kid. Contrary, when later on we played in the Ladies' Olympiad, it was kind of a strange feeling that every opponent was a lady player. Mm -hmm. So... When I was a kid, I was six years old. My first tournament was uh, uh, was against adults, and and it was all men. So starting from there, it was very natural that most of the time I was not even playing in my age group. Mm -hmm. So, and the three of us were always very close. So we were helping each other if if we had some strange stories or strange reactions by men. Of course, I had situations when my opponent didn't shake hand or when I beat my first uh, GM in 87 in a very interesting sharp game. Uh, he was reacting very strangely. He ran away and then I think later on they told me that he was hitting his head into the elevator. Okay. <laughs> so there were different uh, reactions and uh, I can also understand it in some way because uh, it... Uh, it must have been very difficult to accept it and to to handle it when, let's say, other uh, male competitors, let's say, they were teasing the the man who was lost, who lost against me or my sisters. So it is a, it is a very interesting journey, but it was something very natural for me. And uh, I think later on, uh, after my teenage years, when I was in top fifty already. It was uh, it was something that they they accepted me. They uh, they said later on. I remember one of the biggest compliment I got when Vishi said that she's mm -hmm. one of us. Like uh, they they really accepted me as uh, as as one of the strong players, and I fought for this very hard. I was uh, I was living studying and and being very modest in tournaments i was uh, definitely trying to be i was always wearing pants or most of the time and uh, not uh, dressing uh, any anything provocative uh, so i was paying attention on this that i really wanted to prove myself on the chessboard and not uh, not being criticized or or uh, or accused of using uh, girl or, or lady mm -hmm. tricks mm -hmm. so i was always uh, focusing very much on on the chessboard and even when i i was sick or i didn't feel good or whatever whatever this kind of thing happened i was always ignoring uh, not talking about it because i didn't want to be the one who who tries to be looked at that uh, she's looking for excuses if something doesn't go wrong so I was uh, I was very much uh, focusing on the chessboard from every aspect. Excellent, excellent. Well, maybe maybe extrapolating a, a little bit, um, we can perhaps um, touch a little bit on on the subject of gender equality. And what what's your opinion on on this? Is, is there any gender equality in the chess world? Um, and if no, in what sense? Or and perhaps how could it be improved? I believe that absolutely there is no gender equality, but there is no gender equality mm -hmm. nowhere. Uh, so it is not an exception. Only in chess you see it very uh, clearly and, and there are very sharp remarks many times. I simply believe that uh, examples are and models, role models make a great help to girls. But I think the basic, really the basic uh, critical 
question is how the society is accept a clever girl. If it's in chess or in other field or in mathematics or in science, different things. And uh, not only that, but, but moreover the parents. What are the expectations for the parents from a girl or mm -hmm. from a boy? And I think I've seen a lot of examples there. I see that, of course, the parents love their daughters, love their sons, but they simply give a different positive feedback on things. And, uh, and girls are simply not encouraged or they are not phrased uh, being clever mostly. They are mainly phrased that you're pretty, you're cute, you're well-behaved. And it is, it is a very common thing, right? Or you, a girl goes to a shop and, and the, the cash, at the cashier, the lady says, oh, how cute you are, right? For a boy, maybe they are asking that, what are your grades? Or, or do you understand cars? Or do you write mm -hmm. programs already? Or something like that. And I experience it that mostly parents, grandparents can make a lot of damage with the, with the attitude and also with the expectations for girls. And if the parents would say to the girl, and also coaches, of course. So my dream is that, that uh, when a chess coach sees a seven-year-old girl being very talented, shouldn't be that they say that, oh, you're so talented that you may be a women's world mm -hmm. champion, chess champion. Uh, while if you see a seven-year-old boy very talented, you say, wow, you're so talented. Maybe one day you're going to beat Magnus Carlsen. And this is already immediately you're cutting the potentials of a, of a kid. And of course, the teacher and the parent, let's say, they have full positive good intention by saying this. But still, it's like you're telling to, to your daughter that, well, you're, you're so smart that you can even finish high school. And then you tell to your son that he say, well, probably you can be a professor. So it is a very tricky thing. What do you put as an expectation to a kid, whether a boy or a girl? But the society, many times, we just want, we just make uh, comments which is not inspiring for girls or not inspiring enough. And this is why I feel one of the things I feel very fortunate, because my parents were always giving me the support mentally, and as much as they could in training also. To, give, to try to give me the best opportunity to increase my chess level, not within girls, within in the absolute level in the sport itself. And they always told me that, well, if you're working hard, you are able to be one of the best in the world. And we were never talking about the ladies. The ladies, we were always looking that the top lady player, when, uh, when I became number one when I was 13, uh, she was much 50 rating or 80 rating uh, mm -hmm. less. And I was just passing by uh, uh, very easily because my goal was much, much higher. And because I was focusing on the much higher goal to reach 2700, I was passing 2600 much easier. So I would, uh, I would really ask parents who has a daughter that uh, they should really think a little bit uh, about that, what are the expectations with girls if they play chess? And regarding ladies' chess and girls' chess, it is something, I'm not saying you have to, you, you should be deleting it or there shouldn't be tournaments for girls, but I think it's not the right way to tell to a girl that you should be playing there. I think it's maybe she is going to feel much better in that environment, that's fine. But I know that there are many girls who would like to challenge according to their level, not about the gender question. So I think it's important that they give, also coaches give the opportunity for girls that if you want to improve, you have to go for stronger tournaments. And maybe it means that you go for boys event or open section event. And if you want, you should try that. If you want to, to play on the girls competition, that's also fine. But it's up to you. So don't give the direction already that uh, that you're something special if you play with boys. Wow, uh, Judy, that was um, actually that were great lessons, I think, for uh, for parents. If if parents of uh, are listening to to our masterclass tonight with uh, with their children, um, girls or boys, 
uh, I think this is great advice you're giving and uh, really congratulations to, to your father and your mother for, for what they have done because uh, um, the mindset is, is so important for, I mean, in general, of course, but in, in parenting uh, as well. And, um, and I, I'm sure you, you are a mother. Uh, your two children are already teenagers, right? Yes, uh, Hannah is going to be 14 in a month and Oliver is going to be 16 in oh. a month and a half, two months from now. So they are teenagers. And I also feel uh, very happy that uh, I have one girl, one boy, because this way I also see myself mm -hmm. how different they can be. And, and uh, But I also believe that uh, they are very different characters. But from looking at it from the gender question, I see a lot that the society was shaping them being so girlish and mm -hmm. boyish mm -hmm. the way they are i think simply the society uh, and the everyday very very small things the, these are the things which shape them a lot being being a lady and being a, a man so it is it is really interesting because for example uh, for many years, I was specifically focusing, I'm not sure I can be proud of it or not, but I was specifically focusing not to phrase my daughter being uh, being beautiful. She has long hair, she's cute and so on. But I was always trying to phrase her her, her mind and, and brightness and uh, similarly to my son. Because mm -hmm. I just uh, don't believe that uh, that it gives them uh, any good that uh, if she gets uh, positive feedback too much on the outlook mm -hmm. of the kids. And as we know nowadays, of course, it is something essential. It is very important if you're a girl that you should be not only smart, but mostly you have to be pretty. You have to have clean and nice hair and so on and so on. Even though my daughter is uh, an amateur dancer, and she likes it very much. She's training a lot, but uh, but I always put the focus in the in in the in their mind, how they develop uh, their mindset, their attitude towards uh, other people, work, and about themselves. We've seen uh, we've seen a picture of your uh, two children at a chessboard while you were you know, while you were speaking. Uh, do do they play chess? I mean, not just know the rules, but do do they also like chess and like to play chess in tournaments? Well, they were uh, uh, playing in chess competitions. That was also very interesting for me. When uh, well, the picture which uh, I sent you, it's mm -hmm. of course they were very little at the time. They were uh, about uh, school and, and kindergarten age in the very beginning. Uh, they knew they know how to the pieces move. They were competing in a few occasions, but it was interesting that they were not learning so much. So they were not so good as people expected them to be. So it mm -hmm. happened quite a few times when I was uh, going with them to the tournament. That, uh, of course, other parents, they were pointing out that, ah, okay, that girl or that boy, she's she's the, the daughter of Judith Pogger. So automatically, <laughs> they, uh, they gave such a skills to my kids, which they didn't have. Yeah. So they couldn't uh, give that expectation to people of, uh, of how great they are. One mm -hmm. or two tournaments, they even played well. But that was not the point. But the expectation was uh, too much for them, I think, and they didn't feel that uh, it inspires them. So they they retired much earlier than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Of course, yeah, they have their other interest, and so so it should be actually. Judith, we have talked in length about uh, education, about chess training, and so on. But now we will we will focus on some positions. I'm sure that people are looking forward to, to, to solving some, some puzzles, some combinations that you have solved. Maybe, um, what about, uh, I think you've, you've played a few times in Switzerland, of course, but uh, there was uh, one special occasion when you came as a, as a very young girl to Beale, um, 1987, wasn't it? Yes, it was, uh, it was a very nice memory for me for different reasons. I was only 11 years old. And uh, of course, to this tournament also, we went uh, uh, with my the whole family because there were a huge festival with different uh, groups. Mm -hmm. 
So there was a group for, for Susan's level and also for me and uh, I was playing, I think, in the closed uh, tournament in the B group and Sophia was playing in the open section, the, the open tournament. And uh, I also had my birthday there and it was a wonderful birthday which was uh, organized by the, the organizers and it was very memorable with a lot of Swiss chocolate mm -hmm. and I remember I even got a CD player which was, wow, it was such a big thing in 87 and a huge uh, ice cream uh, cake. But uh, this game was also something special for me because uh, I won the beauty prize and the beauty prize was a slice, how you say it in English, a bar of gold. Ah, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so at age 11... Uh -huh, uh -huh. In, Sw in Switzerland, was, they, yes, they know it as gold vreneli. It's a small yeah, piece of yeah. gold. Yeah, 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 it's very nice. Yeah, because Credit Suisse was mm -hmm. the sponsor, mm -hmm. so they felt that they wanted to give something uh, special. Mm -hmm. And it was something special, but also I was very proud of this game. At the time I was playing this uh, Pawn Sacrifice Gambit, which was actually played by Kasparov also, I think, against Kas Karpov in a match, if I remember well. But of course my style was something uh, very clear or in that time that uh, I was very tactical. I was always looking for initiative and most of the time I was also giving up material for that. Mostly it was a pawn to start with, but sometimes it was much more. In this position, of course, G3 is, uh, is an option, but E3 is another move. So to somehow the to cut the c5 uh, bishop a bit, Judith? but okay, my opponent... Ju Judith, yes. I think we should mention that your opponent with white is uh, Jean-Luc Costa. Yes, sorry. Yeah, no problem, that, uh, we don't see the names on, on the screen, so it's no problem, but uh, Jean-Luc Costa, who who later became an ah, okay. international master uh, from Switzerland, so he's quite uh, quite well known, even well, though he stopped that playing. Time I I think we, we had about similar rating at the time, at uh, this uh, period. Mm -hmm. Knight g4, e3. Of course, I was very aggressive attacking the f2 pawn and f5. The idea is to go forward with the f4, f pawn. So time, tempies are extremely important uh, in this opening, in many of the openings. Bishop g2, f4. Of course, I was continuing the way which I planned. And of course, in this position, it is becoming extremely tactical. And I was provoking h3, but I had my plan. And uh, Costa played this h3, asking, where is your knight going to be moving? And obviously, as I was a tactical player back then, I was not very much going backwards, I must say. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, it's quite obvious by now that I took on f2. So. I had a pawn down, but now I sacrificed the knight in order to gain time to ruin the king's uh, position. And after king f2, which is a must to take, f takes e3, now there is only move to go back to e1, because if king uh, g1, then the pawn would be pressing e2. It would be e2 in the queen. So king e1 was the only move, and now rook f2. So now you see the the white pieces on the king queen side is all 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 it's like uh, unpleasant. It, it is very difficult to develop. With rook f2, it's very important that the g2 bishop is attacked at the same time. So now there were a lot of different moves for white to choose from. I think d6 was one of the best moves because now rook g2 is not possible because of queen d5 check, and mm -hmm. then the g2 rook is uh, taken in the next move. But I would be developing with the rook, so with the knight. White played rook g1, which is a very logical continuation, defending the bishop for the moment. I played queen f8. If my, my rook would be not on f2, then queen f2 would threaten with the checkmate, which means that sometimes I can simply move away with my rook, and then queen f2 can be the follow-up of, of that. So now white has to be focusing how to develop with his pieces, which is very difficult. Of course, in this game, he's not going to be castling anymore, most likely. And for the moment, there is not a big problem happening for white. But I have to be developing. And I made my developing move knight to a6, which usually we say to 
newcomers to chess that you don't put your knight on the side, but in this situation, it, can, it is very important because uh, knight b4 is uh, threatening not only to attack the queen, but also to jump into c2. So this is why knight a6 actually winning the tempo, and that's why white played a3 to protect against knight b4. But I'm continuing the development, and you can see that everything comes with the tempo. Bishop f5 attacks the queen, and now it's very clear that white has to be playing something to e4. Generally speaking, in, in a game where you attack, it's, uh, it is very important to, to go on and not to give any breathing opportunities for your opponent. So that's why... I'm, sh I'm playing very forced moves and continuously I want to put pressure on white's position. So I took on e4, queen takes e4. And now it's interesting, I leave it for a second that what would you be playing, uh, my audience now? How would you increase the pressure over to, to white's position? White's development is very bad. It's still the C1, B1, uh, and A1 pieces are still back there. White is very passive. The only active piece is the queen on E4. So now let's say if my knight would be jumping to C5, it would be over, right? So in order to make this move, I played bishop D4. So the main idea is not at all defending the e5 pawn, but much more to bring my knight to c5. Because in, when you are having an attack, it's very important to bring most of the time as many pieces as possible into the action. And if it comes with the tempo, it's even better. b3 was played. I played, obviously, knight c5. There are many difficult... I remember I was analyzing this game for weeks, you know. There are so many complicated lines in this position. And in those times, we didn't have computers yet. So it was always we were looking this and that and all kind of uh, tactical lines with many different, uh, different uh, tactical mates and uh, very special moves. But uh, now I just want to show how it can go when things uh, go on the right way. But the whole game is sound. It is not winning after knight f2, but it's very dangerous for white, but he could uh, balance it more or less. Now in this position, bishop d4 was played by, by white. He wanted to give away his queen, but uh, I felt it that the bishop is much more important in this case for me. So I took e takes d4, which was the most painful move for uh, my opponent, because now the knight is hanging, the queen is still hanging. So he went queen d4, rook e8. So the last piece is coming into the action, into attack. And after king d1, I would be giving mate on b3 after king c1. He resigned. But this would be the checkmate. Beautiful. Remember, I didn't play so well the whole tournament. I uh, I made or even minus one. I remember, but this game was worth everything, even if I would have lost all the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, very nice, Judith. Um, there is maybe one. We could we could actually make a, a short break soon. Maybe we could uh, we could pick a, another position of yours from your practice so that you could uh, feed the, the hungry chess players who, who do not need a break, but some others perhaps do, uh, so that they can, th they can think during the break for, for perhaps five minutes or so. Um, yes, you, you have already... Okay, uh -huh. but then maybe I, I just say a few words sure. about this game sure, of sure. mine, and when it comes to the critical point, then we leave it here, okay? That's a great idea, thanks. In this position, 88 was, was one of my best years with after the break, maybe we are going to talk about it more. But I want to show you that in such a structure, the knight on e5 is like in heaven. It's fantastic because there is no pawn on the side which can attack it. And also it's placed much better than the knight on b3. Black's rook on h3 is very powerful because it's on the open file. But now I strengthened the power on the h file with doubling the rook. White played a5 because he thought that he wants to stop 
uh, and block my a6 pawn for later. And he felt that his king on b1 is still very safe. For the moment, it is. I went rook h2 to press either the queen down to d1 to protect on c2 or what was played in the game. Rook g2, rook h1. Now the back rank I control with my rook. White went king a2, and now I felt that queen a4 at one point, maybe I can give a checkmate. Mm -hmm. So I went queen d7 just in case that white cannot go with his knight to d4 because it would cut the rook's power and it would stop controlling the a4 square. So I felt this move can be very powerful. My opponent went knight d2 because he wanted to eliminate my knight on, from e5 with knight f3. I went rook h4 because I wanted to exchange the rook and I wanted to control the fourth rank, which after my opponent went knight f3, I took and I found something very good move. And maybe for the stronger uh, uh, participants, I would leave it here. It's black to move and it's a forced uh, win, either a rook, or it's going to be a checkmate. So it's black to move and wins in a few moves. How do you take advantage of the weak king on a2? Well, thanks a lot. We'll see you back in around five minutes. Good luck for the puzzle. So it seems uh, it seems Judith <laughs> stopped the Skype call and uh, and left. So, but you do not have the um, ah here it is. Yes, you kept it. Okay. No, I'm here. Ah, you're here. So I don't know what it actually happened. Okay, there was a small technical hap happens here.
So I think, uh, Judith, are, are we ready to, to go on? Sure. All right, great. So I have a few answers by, uh, by viewers in the chat. And uh, there is indeed um, a right answer by Dodo, Dodo A, who suggests Rook 1 to H3. Exactly. This is the right move, Rook 1 to H3. And the question is, what is the idea? White has to go Queen E2 mm. to keep control over the E4 knight. Yes. And Mr. Dodo so gives the right answer, uh, right answer until the end, with the, the queen sacrifice on a4. Well seen, well spotted. Yeah, and this means that whenever your king is is open, by an, any means, still you have to be watching after it because uh, I, I remember how happy I was that I couldn't believe it that simply it's uh, it's working everything so mm -hmm. clearly and so well. So after rook a4, rook takes a4, and suddenly it's very clear that the back rank is a killer. And with the two rook in their teamwork, mm -hmm. I won this game. I was just 12 years old uh, playing in Reykjavik the first time I visited Iceland. And 88 was, uh, was an amazing year for me. I won like, uh, I think, seven tournaments or eight tournaments with a very clear score, wow. big scores in different tournaments. So that was a year when uh, only from July, those times we had six months uh, period for one rating list. Mm -hmm. And I won 190 rating points uh, in half a year. Not bad. <laughs> of course, then I, I, I had a bigger uh, rating increase yeah. possibility because I was... Yeah, I was like 2365 and uh, I became 2555. And that's when, after the Chess Olympia at 88, I became number one between the ladies mm -hmm. and definitely in the top uh, 100 in the open section. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big boom for me. And this, this Olympiad in, uh, in 1988 is also very memorable because you and your sisters uh, together with a fourth member of the women's team, crushed the whole women Olympiad, uh, crushing the Soviet team and all the others, right? Well, that was very special for my family, for us as a family, as a sisters, because uh, we were not playing and competing with the, with the ladies, only when we played in open tournaments and time to time we were playing in, in those events with other ladies. But this was very unique and very special that uh, the captain uh, at that time, he decided that he goes for the, for the best rated team. And in those times, we were practically the top four players, the three of us and model. Mm -hmm. So he decided that uh, he doesn't want to move on with the, with the older generation, but he wants to move on with the youngster, the teenager team. And I was just 12 and a half years old. Sophia was nearly 14. Uh, Susan Ann Model was 19. So we really were really, really young, though our rating was already pretty high. But you know how people are? They were thinking that, oh, well, it's just by chance. It's maybe they are playing against men, so it's easier to raise their rating and so on and so on. And... Um, I remember that uh, Leoncho Garcia, for example, who is a very known chess journalist and sport journalist from mm -hmm. Spain, he was there and he was telling me later the story that uh, when he was there and he was started to look around what is going on, who is playing, who are the competitors, who are the favorites, then he saw the Hungarian team having Polgar, Polgar, Polgar in the team. And uh, he somehow looked at it and said, well, okay, it's going to be good for coloring the stories, right? It's something interesting to talk about. And then how the Olympiad passed after uh, six, seven rounds, the tournament the Olympiad was 14 rounds at the time. And uh, somehow by the middle of the Olympiad, we were the news of the, of the whole Olympiad as we were already taking the lead or we were there on the top three spots. And it was very clear that we were uh, very much uh, going forward to try to, to win the gold medal. Of course, we needed some luck as well. That's not question, but it was very clear that, uh, that we were winning our matches out of the three games 
two and a half. Mm -hmm. So that, that was very clear that the only question was how badly we are winning against the opponent team. And I also brought you some uh, some moments, chess moments there is, from there that is Olympiad. Actually a picture of your, uh, your sisters of, uh, of the Olympiad. Is it the 88? Uh, I think so, yes. That's the 88. And the, who, who? It, uh, it was the first Olympiad, yes. It was just after a few minutes after uh, uh, we won, we got the news. Uh, we played against Sweden in the last round. Of course, it was. Uh, we had the same uh, points. I think we won with 33 points, 32 and a half or 33. I'm not sure. And uh, with some Buchholz was the question whether mm -hmm. who is going to get the gold or the silver in their neck. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was a very uh, interesting feeling. Mm -hmm. Who is, who is the trainer in the, in, the, in the front? I cannot recognize the trainer in the front or the, the captain. It was uh, uh, Tompa Janos, Janos Tompa. Ah, Tompa. He was actually the coach of model for some time. Mm -hmm. He's an international master uh, from Hungary. Already in those times, he was not so competitive anymore. But I must say that he was a good captain. He, he made a very serious decision because uh, actually, unfortunately, during the Olympiad after round seven or eight, uh, model's boyfriend who was on the way in uh, onto the Olympiad unfortunately they got in a car accident mm -hmm. and he died mm -hmm. so we had some very big drama on that Olympiad and uh, and there were some very serious decisions to be made by the captain but actually she started to continue her tournament after this horrible news uh, to play against the Soviet team and actually she scored the wow. point. Mm -hmm. That's how we won against Soviet Union at uh, the Olympiad. So there were some uh, big roller coaster uh, moments emotionally for many reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, we won the gold medal. So it was uh, it was very special for all of us. So, yes. And so about uh, a few a few examples from from this Olympiad. What? Yeah, I had uh, two examples I wanted to show you. In this game, finally, I was playing with the white pieces. It was a Sicilian of three bishop b5, not an open Sicilian, but a close Sicilian. And which was also very strange that uh, in my uh, youth, I was playing not necessarily the right openings, which I would, let, let's say, suggest to the youngsters now. I was playing King's Gambit, for example. Mm -hmm. Possible at the time, because I was very tactical and I could afford it somehow, I don't know how. But also I was playing... Uh, some gambits and uh, I was playing not the sharp main lines, open lines necessarily, but I was handling it and I was still having some uh, good performance and good games, but I was going on to play uh, these kind of sidelines uh, until I was clearly over 2500. Mm -hmm. Even when I was over 2500, uh, I played King's Gambit time to time. Mm -hmm. So it took some time to change to really serious openings. But in this position, uh, it's move 14. Again, I have a pawn down already. I sacrificed, but I guess it's not a surprise by now. Mm -hmm. And now in this position, uh, it is very clear that when you have the fianchetto, okay, normally you have your bishop on, on g7. So when the pawn structure is f7, g6, h7, the bishop, the black bishop, is really the key a piece in this position into defense. So if this bishop would be not there, then the black squares front of the king would be vulnerable. So taking this account, I played rook e1 and offering a piece, it's a sacrifice, which my opponent thought, well, she's playing against a small kid, probably she blundered. And it was not exactly the case. <laughs> and she took with bishop c3, Chilingirova, was uh, taking it, b takes c3, and she took queen b5 as nothing, no problem can happen to her. And in this position, I go queen h6 with the idea of next move to be bishop f6 with the idea of queen g7 mate. So black has to be defending this, either the move what he played, queen f5. If black goes f6, then I would be going bishop f6 anyway. So queen g7 is a threat. And if after rook f6, rook e8 check, 
king f7 and then queen f8 checkmate. So this way, black cannot defend himself. So queen f5 was the move which was uh, played in order to defend against bishop f6. And again, I would suggest to our audience to write me how did I give mate in three in this moment. I did not give mate on the g7 square, mm -hmm. but I took advantage of the fact again that black has uh, not very good development. He's still back in development because his bishop and the knight did not move yet. And uh, I can be having uh, a checkmate pattern with the queen, bishop, and my rook on e1. Someone is suggesting g4. Well, g4 move bit... is my, it's my move, generally speaking. Definitely, I was playing g4 in my life in many different positions. But here, the... But that g4 would be a check. So that's mm -hmm. a problem. That's why g4 is not the best. But I see Alex is pointing out mm -hmm. that queen f8 and exactly. Well done. Queen f8 is the move. And after king f8, I go bishop h6, king g8, and again, a back rank mate. So you have to pay attention on the back rank mate for sure. And uh, you should always look after your king in such a cases. With this game, again, I won the beauty prize of this event, mm -hmm. which was uh, very special. But to tell you the truth, this was not the only uh, cheerful thing for me, but also that later on I got the information that Gary Kasparov was watching my game uh -huh. and realizing that actually I, uh, I performed quite well. At this point, I think I dropped only half a point. It was round uh, 10, maybe, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. But I won already quite a few games in this uh, Olympiad. And later on, I finished with the 12th win and one draw. And only one occasion I was uh, not playing mm -hmm. in the team mm -hmm. as I was resting. So that was very special for me that I got to know that Kasparov was watching mm -hmm. my game. <laughs> well, later on, you... you... He got to watch you from closer since you had to face him many, many times uh, in your career. And um, you had a, a few wins as well against him, of course. And yeah, and actually, after this, in this tournament, I have another game I brought you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind, I show sure. it now. Yes, please, sure. Uh, in this position, I was playing with the black pieces. So this is the last one. And this is the last game of the Olympiad, and we were playing against Sweden. Mm -hmm. Susan was playing against Pia Kramling. That was a very tough game, and actually I think that was the last game of the Olympiad, and that was uh, very crucial for us. But... Uh, but my game was uh, finishing uh, earlier mm -hmm. and uh, I was scoring. I had a big score. I had 11 and a half out of 12 games uh, until that moment. So everybody was kind of scared of me. <laughs> and uh, my teammates, uh, I was playing on board two. Susan was playing on board one. And on board three, it was uh, Madel and uh, Sophia. And... Uh, my teammates were, they were saying that, well, how great it is that out of the three games, we always start with the win. <laughs> we can make sure that, that we, we have one point. And in those times, actually, it was not like now that it's a, it's a team win, but mm -hmm. actually we had to co collect points. Yes. That's how it added up, mm -hmm. every board point. And uh, in this position, again, the white king can be in danger, but for the moment, the queen on c6, it's controlling very nicely the diagonal. So I went rook d5 in order that uh, my plan is actually is a threat to play queen e4 check. And if after king g1, white would be, black would be going rook d1 and the c6 queen would fall off. Mm -hmm. So my opponent played queen c2. And obviously, I was also very famous not to exchange queens. I was always keeping my queen. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I realized that after queen e6, it's not only I go out of the out of the exchange, but also still white cannot exchange the bishops 
on the long diagonal of bishop c3, and I had the feeling that my opponent had this plan. So she played Borisova, uh, she played bishop c3. I remember that she was in heavy time trouble, that was very clear, and she wanted to simplify the position uh, and felt that she has the time uh, play, to play bishop c3, and the g2 king is not in trouble yet because the c2 queen is controlling uh, the e4. But now I played the very good move. We are waiting, maybe some of you are going to make this move. I think it's not really difficult, I must say. My rook on d5 is very powerful. It can go sometimes to d2, but also on the fifth rank it can mm -hmm. be very powerful. And still I can take advantage of the fact that the king on g2 is standing on the long diagonal where I can give a check at one point in a very powerful way. So I played rook c5. So it's not only that I pinned on the c5 with my rook, but also I freed the opportunity. Yeah, Oliver Marty mm -hmm. said rook c5 also. Mm -hmm that uh, queen d5 or queen c6 can be the move, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why whatever white is doing, if white is moving away with the queen, then queen c6 and I win the bishop. Or what happened in the game, bishop f6, queen f6, now I'm controlling with my queen the long diagonal, so the g7 king cannot get any check because that would be the only way of escaping for white. But for now, white has to defend still the c1 knight, the c1 rook, and then queen c6 would be just winning the rook. And at this point, <laughs> it's something very unusual happened. I also have it up on the YouTube. You can check it, uh, uh, looking uh, Chess Olympiad 1988, Judith Polgar, or something like that. You may find it. We will, at this we will point, add the link. We have the link. We will add it in the description also uh, okay. later on in the... In the in the commentary or in the description of the of the video, so people can just click on it and, and go and have a look later on. And you don't believe what happened? My opponent played queen takes f6. <laughs> and this is what happened. On the computer, you cannot make this move that you, you play queen f6, right? But with your hand, you can make a move like that. And you can see on the video also that when my opponent took on f6, I just took my queen back from the other side of the board. <laughs> I put my opponent's queen back to c2, I put my queen on f6, and I pointed out that this is an illegal move. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was in big time uh, trouble, like right? A, it was a very heavy time trouble, and I don't know, somehow uh, he was she was hallucinating or or something uh, happened which uh, shouldn't have. But uh, anything can happen. It was Chess Olympiad and we were playing for the gold medal. So uh, at the age of 12, I was, uh, I was also a little bit uh, giggling or laughing, smiling mm -hmm. uh, at the board. And I remember I put it back and I knew that I'm, I'm winning the game. So actually, White played the uh, queen takes c5. And then in a few moves, I, I still had to play good moves. So queen a1 was sharp and good to, to not only to attack the a2, but also queen e1 is possible. And uh, so technique is also very important, but uh, it's important now that my queen is going from the back rank. As you see, again, the back rank is very important. And uh, in a few moves, uh, my opponent resigned. And within a few hours, we got to know that we also won the gold medal. So this was, uh, this was a funny uh, kind of uh, game and, uh, and story. But of course, uh, with this Olympic gold medal, we also got in a completely different, uh, uh, different status in Hungary. We immediately got uh, the biggest sport award or merits which mm -hmm. which we could receive and suddenly the hungarian federation was also proud of us mm -hmm. and and things were, were a little bit different of course it was a big step for my parents also as uh, accomplishing something very big not only sportive point of view but uh, a kind of milestone in our career even though the main goal was to become uh, to reach much higher objectively in the open section 
sure, sure. I, uh, I kept in mind a question I saw earlier on in the, in the chat uh, for uh, a better moment. And I think maybe this moment is, is, is a fine one because uh, you had these great years, 88, and of course, rising to the top. Um, but the question which was asked by Vincent Riff was, um, how, how did you react, maybe not only in these younger years, but also later when you were uh, um, experienced grandmaster uh, already, uh, how did you react to bad, bad tournaments? Uh, how, how did you do to keep your motivation uh, as high as possible? Uh, well, usually you fight with yourself mainly. I mean, you have to, you always want to get better. You want to play better games, interesting games, better results. For me, it was always a, pri well, for a long time, it was a priority to play beautiful or entertaining. Not, not only for my public or my fans, it was about myself that I simply liked the, the, the very tactical combinations, uh, unexpected moves and opportunities. And this, this gave me a lot of uh, motivation for many, many years. And then uh, when I got to top 10, it was, uh, it was interesting because uh, I could enter into top 10 already when I was married. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, with my husband, he, he's very uh, big sport uh, fan, generally speaking, and he always thinks see things in a in a sportive uh, way that about results. And he was appreciating very much my uh, my games. And he's an amateur player. He's uh, he, he likes to play chess also. But we were analyzing kind of that uh, it was for many years for me that I remember. It happened quite a few occasions that I played, let's say, three or four tournaments very well. I was raising my rating points, and then I dropped it in one tournament because I was playing badly. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of stabilizing myself and said, okay, if I'm in bad form, why should I provoke things and why should I be so aggressive? Then maybe sometimes it's just better not to, to force things too much and maybe even a short draw. If nothing comes out of out of the opening, I may be making uh, draws. So I st when I started to be more solid in some ways, then I could enter into the top ten. And uh, but I also had very critical periods in my life, like in in 2000. I remember when I played in Vacanze, it was a very very difficult uh, uh, tournament for me. For different reasons, I also had some uh, health problems like tonsils, but I didn't even put it together that it, it was affecting me so much. But that was not the only uh, only difficult moment. Of course, sometimes it happens when when you lose your uh, your motivation because you don't work enough, you don't work in the direction you have to work, and then you have to revise your your attitude, your goals, your uh, ideas, your your working system, new trainers, and these are of course very difficult. But for example, when I had a difficult tournament and I started to feel that okay, I cannot play chess. I'm just everything turns out to be bad. Mm -hmm. Whatever I play, my preparation is not good. Uh, I blunder. I mean, just nothing works, right? It happens uh, not too often, but it happened quite a few times. And and then many times uh, what helped me, I just calmed down. I said, okay, let's finish the tournament and then let's look really what is happening. And then I started to look my games. I had to realize it, that maybe my opening preparation is bad. Maybe I have to switch uh, in my attitude. My I have to reset my goals. And then many times I just started to pick uh, pick my older games, which I was very proud of, and the games I was happy with. And I started to look and and build my self confidence back. That, well, actually I could really play chess well, and I had this game and I had that game. And then uh, with a fresh look into my chess, I could uh, build my self confidence back. Because uh, when things go wrong, usually it's never as bad as it seems from outside. And when it's very good, it's also most of the time they phrase you much higher than uh, the, than how good it is. So 
and I learned it to to handle this and and get over. But of course, it's uh, it is very difficult to handle. And my husband helped me a lot, and my family in this, because uh, in crisis, in different difficult moments, of course, uh, it means a lot when your loved ones are supporting and and get you over with these difficult times. Mm -hmm. And they, it's actually when we when we look at the um, let's say the few ones like Magnus Carlsen, Gary Kasparov, Bobby Fischer, the way they they um, deal dealt with with um, upsets, um, defeats, the rare defeats they they suffer from time to time, they are um, they tend to react very si in a similar way. Uh, I don't know. Um, they're very upset, very angry at themselves, uh, most of all, and uh, certainly very critical in high tide as well. Um, I think you've, you've played against um, both Magnus and, and Gary in, in practical tournaments, I mean, over the board tournaments, normal tournaments, but you've also uh, played against uh, Bobby Fischer when he was in Budapest, and so you got to know him personally as well. Um, perhaps you can also tell us uh, some stories about about these uh, special encounters with a with a very mysterious person uh, from from chess history. Um, but there was was there. A... Yes, it was. Yes. No, it was very interesting uh, when he came to Hungary. We met him at Kanija outside of the Hungarian border at uh, the first time, not long after his match, few months after his match, uh, rematch with Spassky and Svetistafan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was interesting to meet him. Of course, it was a huge thing that, wow, we meet Bobby. It's, it's like, uh, it's like uh, unimaginable uh, imaginable mm -hmm. thing, right? It was, it was, it was like crazy. I mean, he was world champion and he was a legend and the whole world knew about him before I was even born. And, uh, and it was, uh, Susan was not home in Hungary. She was playing, competing somewhere. And it was only the four of us, my parents and Sophia that we visited him. And, uh, we even played a little table tennis and, uh, uh, and then my father enthusiastically told him and convinced him that how great Budapest is and why doesn't he come over? We have a lot of beautiful places, a lot of uh, uh, thermal bath, we have great food. So he, he got very tempted because he was kind of bored the, there and he couldn't go back mm -hmm, to the sure. States, right? And, uh, and then he moved over to Hungary, which was in 93. He was very frequent, almost daily guest at our uh, our apartment and even in our summer house. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, he was always busy explaining the prearranged games uh, of the Russian players and all the stories which he was uh, he was uh, so obsessed with. And uh, and it was kind of strange that even the most ridiculous and uh, awful things he was saying, he was always saying it like little childish, little uh, smiling, laughing. So it was it was so confusing that you couldn't really take him seriously because the way and the exaggerations he was uh, saying, explaining, doing, mm -hmm. those things were, uh, were uh, uh, really, really very confusing. At the same time, the legend is here, right? So mm -hmm. it was very bizarre, especially looking it, uh, looking it back. Uh, this this situation, and uh, but we had uh, interesting and fun times. He was a huge eater. He loved Hungarian fish soup, the halasli, mm -hmm. and he loved uh, Japanese food. He was uh, he was going. He could eat enormous amount of food. He loved the thermal bus in Hungary. He was always visiting in different ones. And then at one point he got uh, insulted on some uh, non-existing story that uh, the American embassy wanted to invite Sophia for a Simo. She didn't play the Simo, but Bobby was sure that she did the Simo and it was, he felt that it was a betray. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then he just simply moved on to, I think, to Japan at first, and then he ended up in, 
in Reykjavik, but uh, mm-hmm. it was interesting to to see him. And uh, Eugene Tore was visiting him in, in Hungary, in Budapest, so we had him also in our house. And Paul Banco was a good friend of Bobby. And uh, so it was uh, it was an interesting journey. I'm not sure. I don't know what to say, whether would I be more happy not to meet him and and uh, have him in my mind as as the big Bobby Fisher, the legend, the amazing, the fantastic. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, once you meet a legend and you see the drawbacks and you see the the very unpleasant uh, sick mind we can say mm. it's mm. it's not necessarily so positive but it made my life richer that uh, that that i met him and uh, i experienced his stories and the way he he was existing mm-hmm. in hungary he was so always you, very cheerful mm-hmm. you didn't play too much chess or analyze too much chess with him Unfortunately, he was not ready to play a one-on-one uh, game uh, with me because there were a lot of talks about uh, a potential match between me and him. And he said, well, if we're going to play a match and we're going to advertise it that it's the first time we ever play, it must be true that it's the first <laughs> time we play. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> why not? <Yeah. laughs> very straight. Why not? <laughs> well, he had these very, very clear ideas. Like he said that he would never ever play on a on a match which is sponsored by a tobacco company. Or oh, yeah, uh, yeah. so he had these very, very clear principles. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm I'm not sure whether he didn't want to challenge me because he was afraid or he was uh, mm-hmm. not sure of himself, mm-hmm. or he was really only thinking about this that uh, that uh, we should be honest and it should be really true that we meet for the first time. Mm. I think there is this small story of. I think this was, the, of course, the years when he was still in the United States and an, an active chess player, when he, he got an offer to be sponsored for, for making advertising for some shampoo. And, and he refused because he said that he doesn't like the shampoo, this, this sort of shampoo. So, some kind of <laughs> <laughs> so there was some sort of story like this, which basically is well, more or less in the same vein as, as what you're telling with the match. Yeah, I mean, he was like that. It was uh, very clear. He was not living on a high standard. He, he was, he, he was uh, happy to pay money for food and whatever he needed, mm-hmm. but he didn't had have uh, big demands or uh, mm-hmm. he didn't want to do too much of uh, of, of big uh, things he, he was just happy with his everyday uh, bath visit and uh, mm-hmm. thermal bath sure. visit and nice food and nice company well, so it's good advertisement for for budapest as well you're making here the thermal bath and and uh, and well, actually, and... Budapest is, is one of really the nicest city in the world, I believe. There is a problem nowadays that due to the pandemic, of course, people are not traveling yet. But yeah. once uh, the borders are open up again, I only can suggest uh, everyone to visit for a weekend. And there is a global chess festival going to be in October. <laughs> so yes, that's already yes. potentially a, a place to, to come to connect uh, uh, chess with pleasure. We are certainly going to speak about this a little bit later, just uh, towards the end of uh, of our uh, masterclass, Judith, because this is one of your main activities nowadays since you have retired. But before that, uh, I think we should move on, perhaps to to the the years where where you were at the top, and also perhaps speak about what you consider are um, the ingredients to to becoming so strong, let's say you have potential, you work a lot when you were a kid, but but then there are some steps, further steps needed to reach the top. Uh, what, what can you perhaps recommend to um, now perhaps stronger players or stronger y- youngsters who are um, uh, ambitious and would like to, to reach the top as well? Well, first of all, uh, you shouldn't. Uh, you should be happy with yourself when you make a good result, but uh, you shouldn't think that you are not vulnerable. And uh, actually, there is a next example I would be happy to show. And until mm-hmm. until uh, we are discussing and telling you the story, maybe my our audience can mm-hmm. saw 
off. I was playing this with the white pieces and I saw why this is not good, but still it seems like I'm saving the game with the white pieces. So with black to move, you can think about it, how, what was the move which after I resigned actually. But uh, so it's a typical uh, uh, situation when this was uh, right, uh, not long after uh, I became number one in the world and this was 89. So mm -hmm. I was probably very happy about myself and uh, the things are really going on the, on an extremely good way, unbelievably good way. And uh, still, of course, you, you start to get uh, punches, right? You start to play against stronger opponents. You, you start to have bigger challenges. And suddenly you realize that which was working yesterday, the opening or, or your attitude or uh, whatever, it's not working today. And I mm -hmm. think today it is happening even more because in, in the data, in information, you're getting it even faster than before. So I think it's very important to be critical and self-critical about yourself. And uh, and in that case, if you're self-critical, you analyze your mistakes, you analyze the directions, your new strategies, in which direction you want to go, then I think it's going to be fine and you're going to be uh, developing uh, quite fast. But uh, it is also a case that uh, in 89, I was uh, having making my first Grandmaster Norm. And uh, once you get your title of being a Grandmaster, it was, I knew many people who had the same feeling that it, it comes like you accomplish something, you completed something, your huge goal, and then you realize it that, and what's next? Mm -hmm. And then I had to rethink about it that, wow, once I became a grandmaster, it was uh, uh, an enormous, incredible milestone at the age of 15. And I was breaking Bobby Fischer's record. I became the youngest grandmaster at the time. And uh, so I had to rethink. What I rethought is that I had to be focusing much more on my opening preparation because my middle game was very strong. Uh, that was my strongest part all the time during my career. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to I had to focus on the things where I was not good enough, but still keeping the strengths, the strongest part of my game, which was the middle game. But I started to work with more serious trainers. I was more focused on developing on special areas. And I think nowadays you can even be more specific with the with the engine's help. And also you have to be much more uh, diverse in your repertoire and your understanding. And uh, also due to the fact that you have uh, rapid and blitz and classical tournament more or less equally. So even for those different time controls, you may have kind of a different repertoire because which works in a classical game, maybe... It's, it's better not to use it in a rapid game. And sometimes even dubious things mm -hmm. you may play in a rapid game or blitz game. So I think it's very important to reevaluate yourself and, uh, and uh, rethink about your goals and your small steps as well. All right. Thank you, Juliet. And I, I think we have an answer concerning the position against Gomez Esteban. Yeah. And there is Queen F4. It was Queen Queen F4, actually Queen G4 was just as good as Queen F4, but mm. Queen F4 and and uh, yeah, it happened uh, in a few occasions that I was the one on the wrong side mm -hmm. and against me they were making some nice tactical thing. Actually during the game I saw this, but I thought let's try it anyway. still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> like a bluff. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, to resign is never too late, right? Sure, sure. Um, there is maybe maybe one more uh, one more nice game you wanted to show us. Oh, actually, uh, finishing uh, part of um, of of your game and uh, which uh, which gave birth basically to a study or composition of yours. Uh, this is a, a, a an end game against Alexei Shirov. 
Yeah, maybe I go. I had some other plans also, but the time is flying. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, uh, it's all going so fast too. Yeah, it's <laughs> such interesting um, yeah. discussions we're having with you, and and uh, the chess the chess positions have have to be uh, skipped a little bit, unfortunately. But um, let's take a look and tell us a little bit about uh, this uh, finish against Shirov. Yeah, Alexei Shirov uh, it was on a very top level for many years. He was even a challenger at one point mm -hmm. of Garry Kasparov. He never made it because uh, for chess politic reasons or what do what should I call it? But he was definitely on the top five, top ten players for many years. Very talented. He was also called uh, the young, the new tal, uh, and. Uh, uh, in this, and actually, I could write a full book about the games with him because mm -hmm. I had amazingly interesting mm -hmm. games. And this game actually was also full of fireworks, very complicated, very sharp, uh, Nidorf uh, Sicilian. And at this point, of course, he was a huge fighter. I was a huge fighter, so we didn't usually did not have short draws, but huge fights, ups and downs. And he played king b4, still wanted to go for uh, for little squeezing me. Mm -hmm. But now, due to my uh, childhood experience of uh, of end games and study, I calculated all the way until the draw. Mm -hmm. So I will show you bishop d3 because you can sim simplify and go to a fourth position. C takes d3. King b4. White obviously wants to take the grab the black pawn on the queen side. King d3, king b6. So again, of course, in such an end games, you have to be calculating very well and you have to be in time. And I was in time. King c2. Now with king b7, I would not take on b2, but would that would be a loss because of a4. Hmm. But here black is playing a5, and if a4 then king b3 and i grabbed the a4 pawn so this is very important and uh, so white played a4 immediately in order that after king b2 king b7 but now king b3 again first attacking the a4 pawn and after a5 it's very important for mutual tsukswang to play king a4 and if white would go b3 check if b3 then king b4 and if it's white to move it's a draw mm -hmm. if it's black to move it's a win mm -hmm. so this is how it was a draw and i don't know if i have uh, still time to show sure. my study sure, or sure, sure. we just no, we, of course we have we we can extend uh, we can certainly extend and we'll have to talk about a few other things uh, your your plans and your uh, activities so but perhaps as a last uh, as a last chess example uh, we'll gladly take a look at, at a study that you've composed, which has been inspired by this, uh, the end of this game against Shirov. Yes, uh, I was very, very much inspired because, of course, it's not a special, it's a known pattern. And in, op in, in end games of pawn end games, it is very known that to have Tsukzwang and mutual Tsukzwang, it happens all the time. And it was one of my favorite theme, and it very rarely happens in a practical game. And I created this uh, study where obviously you have to reach the center as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a rule in endgame also that the king can be, or many times is the most powerful attacking piece. King e3. And now a5 is the important move. King d3. King d5, controlling the c4 square for the moment. Now black goes king c2, trying to take grab the pawn on b2. And now I go king b6. Because if I would go king c5, then it would be mm -hmm. king b3. And after king b6, we are reaching to the position which I had in the game. So king a4, b3, king b4, and it would lead to a draw. So this is why after king c2, I go king d6. And after king b3... Mm -hmm. I just leave it for a short time. So what the reason was to play king d6 to go king to c7. But did anything did anything change in order mm -hmm. to to win the game? 
the main idea you mentioned from, from Shirov, uh, the Shirov game, Mutual Zugzwang? I think it's quite amazing in the game to have, uh, generally speaking, Tsukzwang. I was wondering a few times in my life that how would be the chess as a game if we would eliminate Tsukzwang itself? And and I think we just wouldn't be able to play the game. I mean, it would be just a completely different game because in end yeah. game, that's always the come outcome at the end. Yeah, it's true, yeah. And, well, there are even some people who, um, well, like Nigel Short, who's, who claims that uh, stalemate should be abolished, or basically stalemate sh should count as a win and not as a, as a draw, uh, which would change the whole theory of endgames, basically, and sometimes even coming down that uh, to, to some, even some theoretical uh, variations from the opening end up in positions where you have an end game, a pound down, and you obviously hold thanks to those stalemate things. I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you, you've probably certainly heard of, of Nigel Short's idea, or uh, I, I'm not sure how serious he is, but I think he's pretty serious about his stalemate uh, uh, claims. Um, well, if we would uh, change the rules uh, in this direction, obviously the whole game would be different. But, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, I mean, I had an idea, I think uh, first maybe publicly I said it during the World Championship match in uh, 2018, that uh, even if you just don't change anything about the rules, if you just say that black starts the game, you would be surprised how difficult and different it would be just by the psychological effect that now, of course, all the grandmasters and top players, we all know that if we are taking the white pieces, you can take the initiative, right? And there's mm -hmm. so often it happens that if, uh, if the position is equal, then you say if it's black, okay, fine, I'm fine, it's equal, whatever. But if, let's say, you would be just painting it and it would be the other way around, you would definitely say that, oh, okay, I'm better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes even no, psychology a, can change sure, yeah. the game a lot. So mm -hmm. I show king c5, and this is a mutual tsukzwang in this position. So there are mutual tsukzwang in, in uh, quite a few occasions in this endgame. So I, mm -hmm. I was uh, I liked very much this uh, this idea that white is going to d6 this triangulation with the yeah, king. Yeah, that's, that's the key maneuver. Yeah. Yes, king maneuver. comes back to c5 in order to attack the pawn, but the most important is to cover the b4 square for the moment, and then after king a4, king b6, and now it's black to move, so it's uh, it's a win. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Judith. So, um, yeah, we've said it at the, at the start, you have uh, retired from competitive chess in 2014, but you have not left or left us all together as chess players, since you are definitely active as a promoter of chess in general. And also you have um, uh, built this, uh, this festival called uh, Global Chess Festival and uh, well, I, I suggest you you tell us a little more about uh, this. Uh, yeah, this year we are going to have uh, the sixth time that we are organizing it. And uh, we have a very special location. Last year, last two occasions, we had it in the Hungarian National Gallery. The mm -hmm. event itself, uh, we have many different programs, including uh, uh, In Connection, Chess Connects Us. That's our slogan because... Uh, Chess connects everything. During my more than three decades of chess experience, I met so many artists uh, who are involving their artwork uh, and chess themes in their work, or even uh, uh, in, in, of course, chess is a sport, but uh, chess can be a science, of course. Also, just mm -hmm. if we talk about the technology, how much it affected the sport of chess and the game of chess. And of course, we have the education part, which uh, makes a very big role uh, of chess, I think. And there is a big mission by me and uh, I think with many of the, the champions. And maybe this is the only thing where everybody anonymously agrees that how great chess is as an educational tool. So at the festival, we have many different uh, programs like 
lectures, talks, scientific talks, of course, sport uh, events, like uh, we also have simultaneous exhibition with my sister and myself. We have many different kind of chess uh, tournaments for kids, for, for experts, uh, for amateur players. It's a one day event where the whole day is about celebrating chess and show the diversity which our game gives to the to the public and not only for chess player but mostly uh, our mission and our goal is to show it to the people that how beautiful it can be on the board and off the board mm -hmm. as well and what kind of strategical thinking we can show how the the education strengthens by uh, the chess element and uh, apart from having it uh, here as a big festival with uh, a lot of programs we also want to inspire everybody all over in the world on the same day of October 10th, 2020, to have their own event in their own small city or club or mm -hmm. anywhere, any event they want to organize. And we have a website uh, where we upload the basic information of those people. So in the last uh, five years, we had nearly 50 countries uh, who connected uh, to our event on the same day. And uh, with small simultaneous exhibition or a chess club uh, of 10 people, they had a chess lesson. We want to show and we want to reach that we really have thousands of connected uh, mm -hmm. venues mm -hmm. to show that how rich chess can be from really starting from a chess lesson, chess tournament, simultaneous exhibition, or even uh, chess pieces uh, made by uh, Marzipan, as here mm -hmm. we, we have that also. So to show to the parents, to the kids, to the society that it can be a great connection between gender, generation, mm -hmm. a, a fun uh, tool to use it in our life. And, and it can be a connection throughout for kids uh, having friends and connect and, uh, and uh, play online, for example. It is much. Uh, uh, it is something that it can reach in uh, the kids' life, and and I know many uh, doctors, many professors mm -hmm. who who do love the game of chess for for different reasons, and this is the main idea to to spread the game and the, the good things about it. Fascinating, and and Judith, you you send you've sent us a, a link of a YouTube video. We're trying. We, we'll see if it works. Uh, we're trying to have it played. Year. So uh, this year more serious, so we are planning it now, what kind of programs we are going to give uh, for our international audience who are not able to travel and uh, mm. be with us here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it looks like the technique is a bit slightly tricky. In any case, if we can't show it uh, now, it, it will be in the description as well. So. Uh, folks out there, spectators, and people who will watch the, the video afterwards, of course, can always click on the link, which is in the description as well, so that they can learn a little more and watch what happened in previous years. So you were saying for, for this year, due to the, to the corona pandemic, um, how, how is it going to look like? So are you going to be able, and basically, how is the situation also in Hungary uh, now? Well, now it's, uh, it's getting better. I mean, uh, we were in quarantine for about two months. Mm -hmm. Of course, every school was uh, closed and my kids were at home having homeschooled mm -hmm. in their own way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very interesting journey for me. Actually, I was, I was very happy. I, I saw my kids more, much more often and uh, we were talking much more in, in the everyday uh, uh, being. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but by now we can go, uh, go out. Of course, we have restrictions that you have to use mask uh, whenever you go into a shop. Uh, the restaurants are opening up by now. Mm -hmm. But of course, everybody is alert of uh, what is going to be happening uh, in October because there, is, uh, there are a lot of talks internationally and of course in Hungary also that maybe in the in the autumn it will come back mm -hmm. but for the moment hungary is not uh, not heavily a target uh, of the pandemic so we are kind of uh, fortunate lucky mm -hmm. and uh, well we'll see how the events and uh, these kind of things can be organized but uh, we definitely 
will they will have something simultaneous exhibition or a more limited number of people who can mm -hmm. take part mm -hmm. and uh, well you know how it is uh, when things are happening and uh, uh, you cannot really do anything about it you have yeah. to look the the new opportunities which arise uh, from this and uh, if you think about it for chess uh, we are very fortunate in generally because uh, chess is a sport which you can play online and now there mm -hmm. are all the fans I think we are very much spoiled because there is a non-stop uh, competition mm -hmm. on uh, online chess mm -hmm. and uh, for me it is very interesting to see it unfold how it's uh, developing and where it can uh, reach the the online chess competition and uh, it's it's partly due because of the pandemic sure sure yeah well, of course, when, when you can't change things, then there is nothing to, to complain about. I mean, we have to, to be wary of what we can influence, what we can change. And uh, if we can make a difference for chess uh, by, by going online as much as possible and, and making chess more and more popular, also thanks to those master classes, which we would certainly not have had otherwise uh, in, in this form, uh, if not for, for the situation. Uh, clearly, we, we have to bounce back and, I, as you said, chess is, is one of the few activities, sports or, or, or activities which can benefit from, uh, from being so um, developed already online and there are so many more things we can do in general. Um, Judith, you, you also have um, issued many books uh, on your career, on your uh, uh, success basically um, many of them are, are pretty famous are you planning on on writing others or in in the near future uh, i wrote this uh, trilogy which uh, which i made judith bogart teaches chess series it's more than thousand pages i was working on it for more than two years mm -hmm. i think I was very dedicated that I really cover uh, most of the things which I consider uh, important through for my development and mm -hmm. something that I can pass on mm -hmm. for the next generation and that it can be something uh, valuable for the long term. Uh, it was something that I felt that I, I wanted to do uh, by myself. Uh, I had my helper, my good friend of uh, Marin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great journey to look back on. It was a great journey for me to look back on uh, on really my young youngest years and and even discover some interesting parts about my style and and really how aggressive I was. Was I really so dangerous and and how I developed? And uh, I do have other books. We develop educational books where hung in Hungary we have uh, running since 2013 the, an educational program, skill developing, where chess is used as a, by the rules. We are using different elements, mm -hmm. but teachers are using it. So we, we did that. I'm working now on a, on a chess book for, uh, for kids. Uh, who, who just starts to, to have their first tournaments with advices, with basic knowledge, with stories of myself. But that's going to be coming out only in Hungarian uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, now I'm also busy developing uh, more about how the online activities can work and, and be beneficial for, for chess and how to, to give to our fans and audience some quality materials and uh, stuff like that and we are, we are working a lot with my foundation on on the educational progress well fascinating so from a child prodigy to the very top and now a chess ambassador judith uh thanks really thanks a lot for uh for uh, being with us tonight i'm sure all the fans uh have enjoyed that uh, i I would encourage people to write a few questions if they have some. I've seen the chat has gone slightly, uh, slightly more passive, but uh, as we know in chess, activity is very important. So guys, don't hesitate to, to write uh, a few questions if you have some just for the last few minutes. Um, in any case, uh, Judith, thanks a lot. Kusanam, 
as they say in Hungarian, I think. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, excellent. And but thanks uh, very much. It was uh, nice to be here and I hope it was uh, some useful information and background information about my career, my life and some insights on the chessboard. Yeah, very, very useful advice, very useful insights. Thanks a lot, Judith. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to uh, hear much more from you th uh, through your festival. Uh, and of course, looking forward to reading your book as soon as it is translated into English, perhaps German, who knows. Thanks a lot, Judith. Uh, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Yannick. Bye. Thanks. Bye.